Well, thank you all. I am delighted to be here. I'd like to get a feel for who I'm talking to before I st- talk at you. And I found there's one question that can give me a feel for who I'm with. Because you can divide the world into two groups of people. There are dog people and there are cat people. All right, so let, let me check for certain. How many dog people do we have here? Whoa, okay. And how many cat people who will publicly admit it? All right, dog people always win, and that makes sense to me because dogs are better. They just are. I mean, in every way, I've been a dog person my entire life, which is why I was shocked when part of being a good husband to my wife ended up having a sincere funeral for a cat. But it happened somewhat early on in my marriage. At the time, we had just one daughter. She was a little toddler. I was going to seminary. It was a busy day, and we rented this tiny little house had a shared driveway with another very tiny house that was occupied by a single gal who lived there with her cat named Remington. He would claim the property as cats often do. One morning I was ready to get an early start. I had so much going ahead of me and so I'm pulling out of the shared driveway and I saw Remington on the street right in front of the driveway and hit over a night. A car, truck, something had gotten him. I thought, man, I can't just leave him here. So I parked my car Went to our neighbor's house, knocked on her door as gently as I could, explain what I'd seen. She came running out, sees Remy, to just collapses, crying on the spot. Well, that drew my wife and daughter. They came out. They saw Remington. Now they're crying on the spot. So I'm practically crying, not between you and me that I cared that much about one less cat in the world, but I'm just trying to be a thoughtful neighbor and husband and father They decided to send him out properly. We had to have a funeral. And since I was going to seminary, I was chosen to officiate. (laughs) So my first funeral, I'm not making this up, was literally for a cat. Uh, It it was crazy. But we, we, we got through the service. I felt like with some degree of sensitivity, I could go about my day. So my wife and daughter peel off into our house. Our neighbor goes off into hers. I touched the door handle of my car. I could taste freedom And then I heard a scream coming from the neighbor's house. I ran up the steps. She's white-faced, Ash. She can't even speak. She just turns and points at her couch, and there sat Remington waving his tail. (laughs) We'd buried somebody else's cat. (laughs) To this day, we don't know whose cat we buried. Obviously, it was not Remington. So my first funeral was a farce from beginning to end. But if you had told me early on in my life that, Gary, part of being a good husband, if you really want to love your life, even though you're a dog person, you're going to have to learn how to care about cats and have a sincere funeral. That's what she's got. I, I could have never imagined it. And, and for those of you who are single, let me just say this. You have no clue what your life is going to face. You just don't. And I've seen so many different situations assault couples once they get married. I've seen poverty and an unemployment. I've seen affluence assault couples literally talking to a man who said his marriage fell apart when he stopped making hundreds of thousands of dollars and started making millions. Some of you will be challenged in your future marriage by a child that that is rebellious or becomes very sick and requires a lot of rehabilitation. Some of you will be challenged by the inability to have children. You you just don't know what you're going to face. Some of you will succeed far beyond what you could have imagined. Some of you will have your dreams squashed again and again and again. You don't know what you're going to face. God doesn't give you that option. But here's what he does allow to you. And this is what I'm here to talk to you about. And I'm so excited about talking about it because I don't know that there's a more important topic other than helping you connect with the Lord himself. And that is while he doesn't tell you what you're gonna face in this life, he lets you choose who you live that life with. You get to choose the person who's by your side that you will face success or failure, health, sickness, prosperity, affluence, all of that. You get to, and I can't overstate how important this decision is, how it will color every day and set the attitude every weekend and holidays. You have no idea how important this decision is, which is why if there is one decision you wanna make in your life on a wise and I believe biblical basis, it's this decision you make a stupid decision on a house, you might lose a lot of money, but you can get out of it. You make a stupid decision buying a car, you know, it's going to hurt you, but it's not going to mark you. Marriage is unlike any other decision you'll make. 
That's why I wrote the sacred search because I found Christians were getting married for the same reasons as non-Christians and none of those reasons predicted future marital happiness or success. I think if we want to root your decision in the wisest basis, we have to go back to the words of Jesus. In a very famous sermon, the Sermon on the Mount, he says in the heart of that sermon, Matthew 6, the agenda that we all should live our life, and I want to make the case, the more you let Matthew 6, drive who you choose to marry, the greater the odds that you set up your marriage to be an incredible success relationally. You'll recall these words, they're very famous, when Jesus said, seek first, not an intimate marriage, not a fulfilling vocation, not a happy life. He said, the first thing we seek is the kingdom of God, his purpose, his righteousness, his reign. We wake up, Lord, you've given me gifts and talents and time and resources. How do I devote those to building your kingdom, not mine. Most people wake up with a selfish orientation. Am I gonna be noticed? Am I gonna be appreciated? Am I gonna get a little better well off, a little more well off today? And, and, and Jesus says, no, you will find the best life when you're living for God's agenda, not your own. And then he says, seek first his righteousness. And I'm gonna tell you just as a pastor, what destroys most marriages is righteousness. There are character issues. People go off. And though this verse doesn't directly address making a wise marital choice, when you apply it to making a wise marital choice, you avoid the two biggest things that bring down marriages. The first one, it's a lack of purposelessness. It's lack of purpose. People get bored with each other. You know, I, it, when you date, you know, you can keep somebody fascinated for five or six dates. You're not gonna keep somebody fascinated for five or six years. None of us are all that, okay? I mean, we're just, we're not that fascinating. 50 or 60 years, good luck with that. I mean, after a while, your spouse knows all of your funny stories, all of your opinions, all of your political stance. I mean, there's just not that much to share. And so without that purpose, romance covers it for a while, but once infatuation fades, if you don't have a purpose greater than yourselves, your marriage won't last because you'll bury each other with your expectations to make life fulfilling. Because God made you to seek first the kingdom of God and if you live for any lesser aim, he's gonna let you face this divine discontentment, this disillusionment and there's gonna be this sense in your soul, there's gotta be more to life than this and it's so easy to blame our marital partner rather than our lack of purpose. It's why I tell young couples, don't worry about falling out of love. Neurochemically, it will happen. Worry about falling out of purpose. It's a lack of purpose that destroys most marriages. Small lives can't sustain big marriages. And then when Jesus says righteousness, basically he's telling us, die to the things that destroy most relationships. It's character issues that assaults most affection. I mean, when you're infatuated with each other, you're just crazy about each other. But when you start to see people act out in ways they're acting with pride or with lust or, or selfishness or greed, that's what destroys our affection for each other. That's why I also say don't worry about falling out of love. Worry about falling out of repentance because I see a lack of purpose and a lack of repentance leading most people to divorce. And so when you say, this, I wanna be a person who's seeking God's best as far as my purpose and as far as how I live my life, and you find someone else that's doing that, you're gonna have, I believe, a great marriage. Jesus says, and all these things will be added unto you as well. But that's not why most people get married. They don't get married to share God's purposes with someone else. They don't tend to get married so that we can inspire each other to live a holy life, which I believe is actually the happiest life. The re three reasons most people get married in our culture today, Christians and non-Christians are these. First, it's infatuation. There's romantic attraction. You feel things like you've never felt before. This person makes you, it, it just feels so right. The problem with that is that we know from neuroscience, I mean, this generation above all generations, you can know the science of this. Infatuation, I know, I'm sorry to make this, doesn't sound very romantic, but it's just true. It's a neurochemical response that lasts about 12 to 18 months. And it's wonderful and it's fun. But can I just point out, 18 months won't even get you to potty train your first child. Making a lifelong decision on something that won't even get you, maybe even to the marriage altar, 
it just doesn't become that relevant. And the danger of infatuation, it leads to what neuroscientists call idealization. Idealization means you create a person who literally doesn't exist, but you want them to. And so you give them strengths they don't actually have. You miss weaknesses everybody else sees, but you don't. Here's a classic case. If you're infatuated with somebody, let me just make it a woman, and you're at the cafeteria, and you get up from your meal, and, and the boyfriend's carrying his tray, a napkin flies off the tray, and he bends down and he picks it up, and the girlfriend thinks he should be given the Nobel Peace Prize for that incredible act, how thoughtful. I mean, look, he cares about the wait staff. Obviously, he's concerned about the environment. I mean, next to Jesus Christ, I don't know if a man of this character has ever walked the earth, right? And, and her girlfriends are saying, okay, he picked up the napkin, but you know what? He just seems kind of angry to us. No, he's passionate. That's what I love about him. He's so pa- I don't, I mean, yesterday it seemed like he was cussing that guy out. Uh, no, actually, I think he was speaking in tongues. You know, he, he's, a, he's a very spiritual man. You just misunderstand. And so runs forward and marries him. And here, here's what every counselor, a lot of you as friends may have heard, every pastor has heard, when they get married based on that, he's not who I thought he was. It's a true statement when you marry somebody and you're infatuated. You literally don't know who they are because the infatuation is leading you to create somebody who's not there. And so I'd say that shouldn't, I'm not saying you should run from somebody because you're infatuated. God created infatuation, enjoy it. But don't let infatuation lead you to get married. And here's the thing, this is gonna sound more radical. I don't have time to unpack this, I wish I did. But don't let the lack of infatuation keep you from considering someone. It's not gonna last that long to begin with. And, and not everybody is capable of becoming infatuated to the same degree. So just because Hollywood and Hallmark movies suggest this is really what you should expect, go to science and I believe scripture to make a wiser choice. The, the second reason that people get married, you've got infatuation, it's sexual chemistry. I mean, it's just, you don't wanna just be friends. It's, it's hard to keep your hands off of each other, but here's the challenge. Sexual chemistry is like infatuation. It fades and it won't sustain a lifelong sexual relationship. Like, I want you to be sexually fulfilled in your marriage for the rest of your lives because I believe God wants you to. I believe there's biblical warrant for that. Look, when it comes to God's creation and he designed sex, I think he hit it out of the park. He was brilliant. It is wonderful within marriage. But sexual chemistry, I've, I, look, I work with a lot of premarital couples and I follow up afterwards. It, it's gonna take you through about a year and then the issue is gonna be more about character. Character is what undercuts sexual satisfaction more than anything else. It's when you're angry at each other and bitter and you feel betrayed and you don't respect each other. That's what usually destroys the sexual relationship. Now, I don't, I don't want to overstate this. I'm not saying sexual attraction doesn't matter at all. In fact, I'll make it a little stronger. If the thought of seeing this person naked makes you want to vomit, please don't marry them, all right? I, because... <laughs> Sex is an expected part of marriage. You should be attracted to each other. I'm just saying sexual chemistry alone won't keep the attraction alive. And then the third thing, so we've got romantic infatuation, sexual chemistry. The third thing is is date compatibility. You so enjoy each other on a date. You have a great time. You like the same things. And you're astonished that no two people have ever been so alike. We both like Star Wars movies and pepperoni pizza. I mean, obviously, we should get married. I mean, that can't be an accident. I don't know anybody else that likes the same things I like. Okay, but can I just say this? All that getting along well on a date and having fun together and really enjoying being around each other, all that tells you is how much you're going to enjoy vacation. How often do your parents go on vacation? maybe two weeks a year, maybe three weeks a year, and then they have to have the kids with them or whatnot. I mean, it it doesn't tell you how you're gonna handle paying a mortgage, running a house, raising kids together, all of the things that most marriages revolve around. Date compatibility gives you no information. And so you're enamored by, we get along so well on dates, you're enamored by sexual chemistry. Guys, I'm gonna so discourage the men here, but I gotta tell you, they've done studies. Less than 1% of your time as a husband will be involved having sex with your wife. 
I, I know you were hoping for a bigger number than that. All, I, all I'm saying is, it can be the best experience in your world if it's less than, if it's less than 99% of your marriage. You're, it's not gonna carry. You're not gonna carry the 1%. I've, I've just seen it time after time. So none of these reasons predict future marital happiness, even all of them together. Boy, I've never felt like this way before. We can't wait to be intimate with each other. We have such a great time on day. Even all those things, most people think, okay, if those three things are present, this is good, we gotta get married. And most people get married on that basis, but look around. Are most people happy in their marriages? Do they have relationships that inspire you? Do they have marriages that are getting deeper through the years? I know you want to be different. Everybody wants to be different, but if you make this decision based on the same basis as other people, you can expect to end up with the same results. So if we go back to Matthew 6, 33, okay, we're going to have a life of purpose together, and we're going to pursue holiness. I, I know... I know pursuing holiness doesn't sound so exciting to a mate, but I'll tell you this. John Wesley said, and I think it was brilliant. He said, I don't know anybody who's happy who's not pursuing holy. I don't know anybody who's happy who's not pursuing. Think about it. Do you know anybody who's addicted who has a happy life? There are moments of pleasure, but man, far more moments of shame and, and hunger and obsession. Do you know anybody who's angry, who's really happy? They're pushing everybody around. You know anybody who's materialistic, who's happy? She can never get enough. She's always critical. Pursuing holiness, it, it, it's, it seems like a foreign concept these days, but really it's the, way, the best way, I believe, to pursue happiness. So we need to know the why of marriage before you can make a wise who. I have, I have a lot of friends, better friends than any man could deserve in this lifetime, but they all have different roles in my life. If I needed to get a roof replaced or I had a leaky roof, I wouldn't call one friend because one of my buddies would come over with a roll of duct tape. It's all right, let's get going. We got to watch the game. You know, put, well, that's not really one. A couple of friends, brilliant lawyers. If I was sued, they'd be my first call, uh, but I wouldn't ask them to repair my roof. Whatever the job is that you need done determines whether somebody is capable. Here's what I'm saying. Somebody can be a great boyfriend or girlfriend and a disastrous marriage partner. But we think if they qualify as a wonderful boyfriend or girlfriend, we should marry them. And I'm saying those are two different things. So the time I have left, I want to just go through a few. I'm not going to get through all I want to get through, but some things that I find younger people just don't consider when they're considering better questions in romantic infatuation than sexual chemistry and date compatibility. The first one, this doesn't sound that exciting, but you really want to find someone who knows how to handle conflict. And I mention this as the top because every marriage is filled with conflict. I was shocked. I thought if I made a wise marital choice, my wife and I would never have disturbances and, and never have disagreements. And I was shocked at how two people who love each other could disagree so much. In fact, as a young husband, I was really confused when my wife would wake up furious with me for how I had treated her in her dream the night before. <laughs> And it seems so unfair. I go, but honey, it doesn't matter. You are such a jerk. And I can't believe, I, I'm sorry. I mean, I, I, I didn't know how to handle that. But here's the thing. I used to fear conflict. And, and now I don't because what conflict does is it reveals what my wife really cares about. It reveals what she values. It reveals her fears. It reveals her deepest beliefs. And so conflict handled in a healthy way builds our intimacy. We grow closer through an act of conflict rather than far apart. If it's a healthy person that knows how to handle conflict in a healthy way, if they don't. For instance, the silent treatment. Dr. John Gottman said one of the biggest, he's an expert at the University of Washington on marriage and divorce and whatnot. He said, basically, the silent treatment will kill most marriages. It's somebody that fears conflict. Well, we'll talk about it later and then they never will. That they're just too scared of it or it just bothers them. If somebody can't come through a problem together, life will tear you apart. There's no infatuation that can last through a lack of conflict resolution. The other thing to really watch out for in this regard is any violent response. If somebody can't handle being angry without getting physical, 
they're not ready to be married. They're not mature enough to be married. And I would just say, women, it is a nightmare when you're working with domestic violence in a marriage. I don't want any woman to walk into that because I'll tell you this. If a boyfriend seems a little too angry, a husband will seem much too angry. Here's here's my advice. One strike and he's out. I know it sounds extreme, but if you've seen the nightmares that I have seen, how women, you've staked your life, you've gotten married, you're building a home, you might even have kids. How do I, how do I handle now a, an angry man that, that scares us a little bit when he comes home until we figure out what mood he's in? And, and marriage is too intimate of a relationship. You're, you're stepping out of a shower, you're in a kitchen with knives, you're, you're asleep, and there's just too much vulnerability in a marriage for somebody that can't handle frustration without getting violent. And guys, I'd say the same thing for you. Because if you're you're trying to just hold her back or just even defend yourself, guess who they accuse? Somebody can be wonderful in all those other three areas, but if they can't handle conflict, they're not ready to get married. The second thing, and and I find younger people don't think about this, you wanna find somebody who'll be a spectacular parent. You're not just choosing a husband or a wife. You're choosing your kids, mom or dad. Now your kids are theories to you now, but when they become real, you won't believe how they wrap themselves around your heart and and how you would die for this person you just met. Theologically, I was actually a pacifist when my first daughter was born. I'd read a lot of Anabaptist literature. I'd done some research. It all changed the morning my daughter was born, not because I'd read any more books. I'd read 100 books on it or heard any more talks. I'd heard so many talks. All that happened is that my daughter was born, and the nurse picked her up and put her on my wife's chest. I took one look at that little baby girl. I said, anybody touches her, I'll be doing prison ministry from the inside for the rest of my life. I mean, it was just like, nobody's gonna lay their hands on it. And I think that's just God's natural call for us to protect. And, and when you realize how much they'll matter, the day will come when you can say, look, kids, I, there's a hundred things I wish I was better at that I could give you. Maybe I could give you more resources. Maybe I could give you more wisdom. I gave you the best mom I could find. Kids, I gave you the best. That not he a good dad? Nothing will make you happier than that. And when you're messing around with somebody who's not even a believer, I'm just gonna tell you what will make you happiest at my age, if you're a healthy believer, is that your kids are walking with the Lord. It doesn't matter about their occupation, it doesn't matter how much they're earning, you wanna know that they're one of God's chosen, they're following God, they're serving God. And when you marry somebody, and, and I just think of this one woman, she said that her greatest desire was her kids to become Christians. And yet she was seriously considering marrying a man who was an atheist with Buddhist grandparents. With Bo- His parents were, were Buddhist, so the kid's grandparents would be Buddhist. And I, I said to her, look, let me just give you an analogy. Let's just give you a picture, because I know what little boys like. I mean, I've raised, he's five or six. He's been going to church with you every weekend because you take him, it matters so much to you. But he notices dad never comes around. And she's natural. Dad, how come you don't go to church? And he says, well, I think that's for women. Or who do you think came married? Just some little silly thing. He's just going to completely undercut everything you're trying to give. And he wants to, he wants to identify with his dad. God, how help, how's that going to help? And then say he spends a weekend with his grandparents. And he, he sees this very colorful little shrine off on the corner. And he says, Grandma, Grandpa, what is this? Because his eyes are drawn to it. Oh, that, that's our altar. It's where we pray. Can we teach you to pray? Natural thing for grandparents who want to teach their grandkids how to pray. Said if the most important thing in your life is for your kids to come to know Jesus as their Lord and Savior, and you marry a man who undercuts that as much as you're trying to plan it, and then he spends the weekend with with grandparents who complain speak of a whole different idea of God, is that really the choice you want to make? It will matter more to you then you can realize the third thing, I know this doesn't sound very sexy, but it is so much more important. You wanna find somebody who really knows how to pray. Don't undercut the value of prayer. Women, one time a, a, a wife spoke to Lisa and I, she says, Gary, Lisa's my wife, I feel so much safer 
when my husband is praying. Now, listen to this. And I don't have to ask him, and I don't have to catch him. I notice it in his attitude. I notice it in the way he treats us. I know the way he handles stress. Prayer makes a difference. And, and, I'll, and I'll just say this. 90% of the decisions I've made in my life, in my marriage, haven't been based on my wife saying, Gary, I need you to change. It's been based on God convicting me by his Holy Spirit, saying, Gary, Lisa isn't just your wife. She's my daughter. And I expect you to treat her accordingly. And women, ask other married women how effective nagging is. I don't know in the history of the world where nagging has ever worked you replace that with conviction of the holy spirit when you replace it by somebody where god himself and and men this is the same thing for you why wouldn't you god will be your best advocate in marry marriage if you marry a woman who listens to god who fears god and who wants to live a life that honors god God is your friend in this process, not the enemy. That's why I say when it comes to physical expression and dating men, you want to marry a woman who will offend you before she'll offend God. You want her to stand up for righteousness before she gives in to you. And I know, how can that be true? Let me just say this. When it comes to sexual intimacy, the same God who tells girlfriends to say no tells wives to say yes. And if a woman doesn't listen to God when she's a single woman, what makes you think she listens to God when she's a married woman? God is on your side here. He wants you to have a fulfilling life. He wants you to have a meaningful life. Again, holiness is our friends. It's, it, it's not one of our enemies. And, and so when you marry someone who prays and they're acting up and, and maybe she's becoming a mom first instead of a wife second, it's God who will convict her, not you. And wives, if your husband is off, let me just say this. I, I've traveled, my, now my wife is with me on most trips, but when our kids were growing up, I would travel mostly alone. Do you want to marry a man who when he's 3,000 miles from you and nobody knows who he is and nobody can see him, he has nothing restraining him if his only fear is that maybe you might find out and you think it's very unlikely you find out? Or do you want to marry a man who knows that God is with him everywhere he goes? every time he's looking at something, every place he enters. You wanna find somebody who prays and listens to the Lord. Fourth thing, you wanna marry a giver, not a taker. You wanna marry a giver, not a taker. Now that sounds selfish for those of you givers, and I, and I love you givers because I think it's the spirit of Christ in you, but here's the, what I've seen in dating relationships. A giver starts dating a taker, and it seems like a match made in heaven because the giver gets to give, and the taker gets to take, and they both feel like we get to do what we like to do. And for a while, it's okay, but marriage is a marathon. It's a long relationship, and when you marry a taker, the time's gonna come when he has to give, and I've seen this over and over again. When the taker has to give, he doesn't feel empathy toward you. You get sick, or you're depressed, or unemployed, or you've got your own issues. He, he feels like, he feels sorry for himself, or she feels sorry for herself, not for you because their disposition, they don't get any joy out of giving, they get joy out of taking. I didn't sign up for this, our relationship worked because you're low maintenance and I'm high maintenance and I, I just want it to stay that way. And here's the thing, if you are called of God in the ministry, you must marry a giver. And here's why I think it's wise and not selfish to marry a giver. If two givers get together, they multiply their ability to give because they inspire each other, they release each other, they encourage each other. Two givers multiply their ability to live, but when a giver marries a taker, the taker soaks up your time, money, and energy and divides your ability to give. And also what makes it so important is if you want your kids to be raised feeling like a project and a nuisance, marry a taker. If you want your kids to feel like they are precious, they're appreciated, that serving them is a great joy, you wanna marry a giver. Now, I like to protect Christians because sometimes you marry somebody that isn't as spiritually mature and 
uh, boy, they act like they're into the Lord because they know you're into the Lord and, and you're challenged to make a wise moral choice. Find out, is he into God because I'm into God and he's into me? Or is he into God because he's into God? And, and there are a couple tests that you have to go to deal with this. One, if your boyfriend or girlfriend never talks about God, they're never talking to God. God is an active God. He convicts, he inspires, he challenges. If you're the one that's always bringing up spiritual realities, you're, you're carrying it. They don't have an immediate relationship with God. They're not becoming givers on their own. Now, another test that you really have to take. A giver or a taker always makes it first and foremost about them. Let's say you're driving you get into a little fender bender, you're supposed to meet for dinner, and, and you call your, your, uh, your girlfriend, guys, and, and she says, what happened? Well, I got into a fender bender, I, I'll get there. Well, I can't believe you did this to me. And you're like, I didn't know I was doing anything. Well, I feel so stupid here at the restaurant, everybody thinks I'm a loser, I'm here alone. And, and can't you just leave? Well, that would be felony hit and run, I'm not sure for our future. And, and you're not trying to make it about you, but for them, it is all about them. The, the, the second way, uh, he, here's what a giver would say, look, I'm so sorry, can I make a call? Do you need me to come pick you up? Do you want me to go ahead and order? They're giving. The second thing is that takers will give when asked, but they always want something in return. You get married, if you married a taker, <sighs> okay, honey, yeah, I know we haven't visited your parents, we probably should, so we'll go visit your parents as long as you fill in the blank. And, and so what a taker does, because they don't get any joy out of giving, they, they have to get something in, in return. And so in your dating relationship, in your marriage relationship, it's always going to be a contest. I'll, I'll give to you if I have to, but I, I need to get something better in return. And then the third way you tell out is, is how do they treat invisible others? Remember, they'll give to get something. If they want to marry you, they'll give to you to get you to marry them. But once you're married to them and the infatuation is faded, they will treat you like they treat their parents, like they treat their siblings, like they treat others. If they give only to you and you notice that they're taking from everyone else, the day will come when they're taking also from you. It's not selfish to want to marry a giver. It's wise if you're seeking first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, you should marry a giver. Somebody who says, together we're going to serve the Lord. Look, the deepest marriages I know are marriages of two people that live for a purpose greater than their own affection for each other. They seek first the kingdom of God. That gives them meaning. It gives them purpose. It gives them fulfillment. And when they're earnestly seeking first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, they're losing all of the things that destroy most relationships. They're dying to the sins that make life miserable. Do you trust Jesus? Okay, at Sterling College, I, I was actually hoping for a little better response than that, all right? So, <laughs> do you trust Jesus? Do you think he knew what he was talking about? Do you believe he has your best interests at heart? Yes. Then when you're choosing someone to marry, lean on his key advice. If this doesn't drive your marriage decision, I believe you're putting yourself at great peril. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Let me pray for you. Father, you know the stakes of every individual here. You know some may be in some very foolish relationships for some very foolish reasons, and you can see the future if they don't let go. They've believed the lie about what creates a fulfilling marriage and some of them might even be flirting with just a disastrous choice. And some, Lord, might have a wonderful choice that would so inspire you and provide a rich life, but because it doesn't measure up with what this culture says a marriage should be, they don't see it. They don't realize what they could have. Lord, I just pray that your spirit would now speak and counsel, and convict, and encourage, and teach to go far beyond what we've discussed here, Lord, so that each person here would make a supremely wise choice based on the words of your son in Matthew 6, 33. Lord, guard them. Guard their minds and hearts, we pray in Jesus' name.